Fishing seems a very tempting way to spend time over the summer months, offering peace and tranquillity in some of the most beautiful places on earth, with the added benefit of some fun socially. Having chatted to knowledgeable fishermen, an interview with Carl Humphreys was an opportunity not to be missed. We hope you enjoy it. Now, a very good morning to Carl Humphreys, MBE, who's going to talk about fishing and particularly the Atlantic salmon this morning. So good morning, Carl. Good morning, Claire. How are you today? I'm very well, thank you. It's a beautiful morning, isn't it? It's stunning out there today. Now, um, fishing is beyond a hobby for you, isn't it? You earn your living from fishing. How, I... how did you get into it? Oh, my, my fishing started many years ago on a small river in the Isle of Man called the Sulby. And my grandparents uh, had a pottery in Ramsey there on the, on the Key Bank. So uh, in the 60s, he would drive me up river uh, with my uh, one of my rods, which was bought with green shield stamps and my uh, cherry aid and lemon curd sandwiches. And I would walk my way back all day down to the harbour and hopefully catch maybe a grill, a sea trout, a brown trout, little bits of flounders. It didn't matter. I mean, I've always been an outside kid. I'll, you know, I love nature and I think the saying is there's more, you know, to fishing than catching fish. Well, there's certainly a lot to it as I've learned. So this has grown into a, a lot, lot more. Um, and you, you have demonstrated for... Um, Queen Elizabeth II and Prince Philip, and they must have enjoyed what you did so much that you were ordered an MBE. So yeah, I think. What, uh, yeah, I think it was a bit more than do? that. Yes. It, you know, it wasn't just because I yes. demonstrated for Her Majesty and and, and Prince Philip. Uh, I think it was down. But obviously, I work for a charity called Get Hooked on Fishing, which I'm extremely passionate about because it's putting something back in into angling, from my point of view, for the next generation. Because, you know, it's vulnerable adults. Uh, special education, lead kids, people referral uni, but also mainstream. Uh, and, yeah, it's always nice to put something back for another generation to come through. You know, I want your kids to go out there and experience the countryside. And if angling is a gateway to get them to do that, well, that's great for me. What sort of reaction do you get from them when they first try fishing? Oh, I think, you know, if we think of the disciplines in angling within the UK, we have sea, game and course. So the easiest way really is to start them off course fishing with a maybe a little whip or a pole or a small rod on a course fish. It could be a canal, it could be a pond, it could be a, a bit of a river. But, you know, we're going to be catching course fish. So we're probably going to be putting a maggot on the end there and watching a float go under. And that fish can be, I don't know, Three or four inches, but I will guarantee the smile's bigger. It always is. So you see is. a huge effect. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's health and well-being as well, and it's getting out there. I mean, how do you get kids nowadays off Xboxes onto seat boxes? You know, it's always going to be a challenge. I mean, when I was a kid, we didn't have all this technology. I mean, we're sitting here now doing a podcast on a you know a Mac Pro. We do they teach you things? Do you see fishing differently through their eyes? I think so. I mean, you know, I'm mid-60s now, so when I'm out with the kids, I need to go back to being, I don't know, 10 years of age again and seeing it from how they see that very first fish, that challenge, being out there, the excitement. You know, I am mid-60s and I still get a buzz or a kick. My heart still pounds when my line goes tight and it could be something three inches or it could be something 20 pounds. But the kick's still there, you know. What, what is fishing? Is it a passion? Is it a sport? Is it an activity? You know, it, it's everything to me. So is the one um, fishing trip you can remember where mm. that was your sort of moment of glory, where the magic happens? I, mean, I think the probably... Feeling. The, the, the first time I hooked my grills, which is a, you know, a yearling salmon on the Solby River, I think that was just it. You know, that inspired me from to buy books, to buy more equipment, to get better. You know, I still practice casting now. You know, I wouldn't want to dream of doing a demonstration for somebody and being unprofessional or not being coordinated, you know, to match my what I'm saying to what I'm actually doing. It is very beautiful and elegant, the casting, when it's done 
properly. Does that make a different, a huge difference? Yeah, I think if you want to be, you know, it, it's practice, isn't it? You know, you get out there and, you know, I don't want to be embarrassed or feel that I'm not up to the job or the task, you know, from standing in a showground with an audience of, you know, three, four, five hundred people. Yeah, you want it polished, you know, so purposeful practice is the name of the game, you know, and I still go out and practice as much as I can. Is there um, a, a, a secret to getting the knack of this special casting or spade casting or the different ones that you do? It, it, that's purposeful practice, isn't it? And going and seeing people. I mean, you know, my my sort of years of wanting to become an instructor came about with a gentleman uh, up in Eskdale called Hugh Fulkus, a famous author, you know, a broadcaster, pilot, uh, and another guy called Peter Mackenzie Phelps up at uh, Weatherby. Uh, and I went to see these two guys, you know, they were pretty much AAP guy instructors at the top of the game. So if you want to get better at something, knock around with somebody who's better than you at the what end of it. What nugget or tip did they give you? Oh, wow. Just if you could just pick one. Uh, Peter Mackenzie Phelps. The most important distance when casting is the six inches between your ears. Think about what you're doing and make everyone count. But do you have to sort of be a very calm person and you can't be sort of rushing around? You have to sort of slow yourself down to be have a calm approach to it to be Well, I'd better. like to think so, but I've seen some people go absolutely mental when they've lost a fish. The rod's been thrown up the bank, the feet are stamping. It's like being out with a two-year-old having a tantrum. You know, there'll be a few more in the river. Something will come along. Yeah. Yeah, be purposeful. Enjoy your time on the riverbank. Now, Hugh Falk, as you've already mentioned, I have had a, um, a little look at his um, esteemed practical guide and learned that um, from his writing, the Romans called this beautiful fish the salmon, which is the leaper. And he quotes as it being one of the most remarkable animals on earth. Now, um, it is the most special fish, is it? Oh, for me it is. I mean, you know, game fish have this little fin called an adipose fin. And that's to me, signifies its royalty. And the Atlantic salmon is the royal fish as far as I'm concerned. It's the prize, you know, that the Romans didn't get it that wrong. Salmo the leaper. Books have been written, stories have been told, they've been passed down for generations about this absolutely remarkable creature that starts life in a river, goes to sea and then travels back to the river to breed and spawn. Yeah, it's a remarkable journey, but we don't talk about it enough. We talk about birds with feathers and other creatures with fur, but we forget the significance of what lives under that surface water. And there's some amazing creatures in there, you know, that have journeys that you could, well, from here to the moon and back. You know, yeah, and how did they, but how do they do it? How do they know where to go? This is the um, fascination, the unknown, that with all our technology and equipment, we still don't know very much about and, and that's beautiful they, isn't it because i travel. wouldn't want to know about it that takes the mystery and the magic away if we know everything mm. it's going to get boring for me you know i don't want to know what i'm going to catch if, it, if at all i do catch you know every fisherman goes out there and has a bad day but a bad day still beats you know a day in the office have you heard about the um the earliest fish cave painting Hmm. Cave paintings, you know, allegedly, you know, we bring to the table in this country Isaac Walton with the Complete Angler, which was sort of oh, written years ago. But before that, 150 years before it, it was Dame Juliana that wrote about it, fly fishing, you know, and she was a prioress. But latterly, we've found not just the cave paintings, but back in Macedonian times, People were fly fishing for the table. You know, we have evidence of that now, you know, and game fish have always been for the table, hence the terminology game as we go out and, I don't know, colour deer, pheasant, uh, 
grow something like that. It was to provide food for the table. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we've done it all, you know, through history, haven't we? But I have read that the in the Dordogne there is a cave painting mm. of, a, of a salmon, life-size, that is the earliest depiction of a fish known, and that 23,000 years ago. Yeah. And that's it's, quite... It's a long time. I mean, yeah, we stunning. don't always get it right, you know. I mean, we, we assume that the coelacanth, which is a sea fish, you know, prehistoric, was extinct. No. They, they, they've been caught in latter years mm. at the end of it. So, you know, we don't always get it right. And our oceans and our rivers and our seas and things are the least, less explored. Planet. We know more about the moon or Mars than we do our own oceans. And, you know, that's great for me. I still like, as I said before, the mystery, the suspense, the not knowing I've been talking to a few friends who've been fishing over the summer and are noting down fish that they've they've caught. Obviously, this is all catch and release, but the Helmsdale yielded five, five and eight in their weeks. The Spey, five. The Tweed, ten. Some sea lock fishing on North Uist uh, yielded one before the weather got in the way. Uh, Norway, zero this, this time for one trip. Um, these sort of numbers, do, um, are they what you'd expect? No, obviously, Atlantic salmon and migratory fish stocks have declined over mm. over recent years. There's no denying it. Uh, is the one cause? I'm not too sure that there is. Do we get it right? I'm not too sure about that either. You know, a lot of money's been invested and, you know, through... I see so the missing salmon alliance and things like this to find out why it could it be uh, pelagic netting and bycatch it could it be climate change could it be predish, uh, predation could it be pollution uh, and I think it's all of it mm. you know I wouldn't put one unit above the other maybe we need to start monitoring and asking our statutory regulators to look into things in, in greater detail, I mean, as a salmon angler, you know, I, I ask all the time, what have we gained from our statutory regulators and bylaws in the last 30 years? Well, we've closed all the hatcheries. We've bought mandatory catch and release into Wales. We bought weight restrictions in. We bought method restrictions in. And we've upped the rod license fee. So, you know, and all that does drive people away from the river. And if your rod data is on catch returns, well, if there's nobody fishing, there's no fish being caught. So it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. No fish in the river. And that's not the case. Fish run in cycles. Tell me about the weather in this country. Do we have seasons anymore? Is it wet and dry? You know, last year it rained for nine months. The rivers were constantly in flood. Traps aren't always effective. Counters aren't always effective if at all they're working. So the data, and you won't beat nature. Nature's so going to You're saying the thing. data, we don't have accurate data. I don't believe we have nowhere near accurate data anymore because they've lost uh, regulators, whether you want to call them the EA or Natural Resources Wales, don't have engagement anymore with the angling community, riparian owners or clubs. No. You know, so uh, which is sad. The, the, the fish farms seem to be um, a huge area of um, controversy. Yeah. Um, it, it doesn't, I mean, is it cruel to keep a salmon in a, a huge enclosure but when they're such migratory? Or well, the different species of salmon? Oh, there's different species of salmon right. throughout the world. So the farmed ones, are they not the migratory ones? Yeah, they're Atlantic salmon, the ones that we farm. But you can farm pink salmon as well, which are pretty much sort of so is you know, that an American unit. It doesn't seem right to restrict them when they are programmed mm. to travel. Yeah, I, I understand that. But we also keep goldfish in a bowl or near tetras in a, a tank. At the end of not the day, on this scale, not, not not on that scale, but we don't eat them either, do we? You know, this is this is for about a food source, and you know, Atlantic you know, farming Atlantic salmon 
does come at risks through parasitic infection on fish. Uh, you know, the volume of it. Is it right? Is it wrong? I mean, I would love to think that we could do it on land and keep everything out of the sea, which there are places now that don't do it yeah, within it the sea. And, you know, and isolate yeah. possibly all diseases and parasitic infections. That would be great, you know. Mm -hmm. I think we've got near enough 80 million people in this country. You know, I see fishing and all the other game sports and things that we do in the countryside as a byproduct. Because after all, the, you know, the countryside is the food factory. You know, it gives us all our food and, you know, we must bring an awful lot in, but we also send a lot out. So Well, we do have to feed people. Yeah. That's right. And, and they, apparently they do have to do predator control around these fish farms. Yeah. Um, which isn't really... There is an acknowledgement there that we need a balanced and a managed system to produce the food. Yeah, you've just said the thing, isn't it? Managed. You know, you either manage something well or you don't. We manage deer. We we manage badgers, whether people believe it's the right or the wrong thing. that, that That's up to them. I don't have a, an issue with it. But I think many years ago, I was fortunate enough to go to a lecture by a guy called David Bellamy, Dr. David Bellamy at Lancaster University. And I always remember his closing statement. And it was the fact that, Wildlife in the UK would manage itself if five million people live here. We don't, do we? You know, there's near 80 million now and it's growing all the time. So we do need to manage our wildlife. We manage our forestry. We manage most things in our life. So we have to manage the otters and the mink on the riverbank too. Yeah, I mean, mink, help you know. The fish stops. Well, otters, yeah, there are programmes out there where we really say, don't mind otters, I don't mind ospreys. I maybe have a, an issue with cormorants and, and goosanders, you know, where we can obtain licences to control them. Not, I don't think any angler would ask for mass extermination to or take a species out completely, but I'm asking people to think about what's under the water as much as what's flying around because all these other creatures aren't going to survive unless we get it right under the water. That's what they're eating at the end of the day, you know, and we do need to control things mm. or so, else we're going to have no fish stocks left at all. They're going to die of hunger. So if we could talk a little bit about the Welsh D local to here. Uh, you know the Welsh D well, don't you? Oh, the Welsh D to me has been home river for 55 years. Uh, caught my very first fish, funnily enough, a probably, I don't know, a good 20 minutes walk from here down by the Cross Foxes at Overton there. I was uh, on a guest ticket by a farmer called Ernie Dimolo at Malpas, who we met through shooting. And I was with a guy who's no longer with us now called Chris Roberts. And we'd come up there, Chris drove, I was probably around 15, 16. And we got these guest tickets and I was there with my brand new, dare I say, hardy fibre, fibre light spinning rod. And Chris had got one as well. I got a Devon minnow on. And we were salmon fishing and Chrissy's there with his worm on trying to catch one. And then all of a sudden my line tightened and I could hear my real whizzing and thinking, yes, I've got my first Atlantic salmon off the D. Ten minutes later, it was in the net and it was a 15 pound pike. Really? Yeah. Off there and about 20 minutes later, never seen it since, I've seen them caught. Not to this size anywhere. But Chris brought in a three pound flounder that high up. So that's come over Chester Weir, come through all that travel up to the D, which means 88 miles long. You know, but it's come all the way up to there. And the first two fish we have out, it's a pike and a flounder. I, it was fascinating. Just you see, love it. You can fish all over the world, can't you? And, and mm. I would imagine. Your home waters or your the, the places where you fish are near your home are just as special? Am yeah, I very right? much so. I mean, you know, maybe we don't have the stocks as we had through the 40s and 50s with migratory fish. But for me, the Welsh Day offers some stunning fishing with its brown trout. And moreover, you know, the lady of the stream, the queen of the river, the grayling. 
It really is a phenomenal grailing river. They even host a festival here, the Hanak Festival. It's that productive, you know, and she's a wonderful fish. She's a I don't know anything about fish. the grailing. I mean, what, what, it's an ice age fish. It's a northern hemisphere fish. So it's a smaller fish, is it? Oh, no, they, they can run up to three or four pounds if, if you're fortunate enough to catch one. And are they catch and release or are they edible? No, you could, you, they are edible. You know, they are a game fish. They do have an adipose fin. They breed in a different season than what we would have a game fish. It goes to a coarse fish in close season then, more than our game fishing close season. So are they highly prized as well? Well, there's, there's a society based all around them called the Grayling Society. A lot of research has been done on them by... You know, certain amounts of trusts, uh, for me, yeah, they're a beautiful fish. In fairness, one of my favourite fish, you know, but maybe I've got the D in my system. It's in my DNA, should we say. Now, the weir, the weir is, um, a loss has been happening at the Bistock Mill. Um, they removed the weir. What do you think of weirs? Oh, right, Okay. Weirs, let's have a think about this one. So we're going to take them all out, which is our regulator's sort of bit of promotion. And we take all these weirs out and it's about removing barriers for migrating fish to move both upstream and downstream. So it's things probably like the Atlantic salmon, the sea trout, uh, the sea lamprey, the Alice and Shite, Twad, eels you know, to clear all this. And then on the other hand, we reintroduce a species that hasn't been here for 500 years that builds dams. The beaver, yeah. The beaver, the Eurasian beaver, you know, a big rodent at the end of the day that gnaws trees down, builds dams. It doesn't just build dams, it can burrow as well. You know, you can have block culverts and uh, undermining road systems or railway tracks. Yeah, I, I think yet again we need to have managed programmes and I would have preferred, other than the releases, to, to work on precautionary principle. I mean, if you probably ask a, one of the gillies in Scotland or a few gillies that I know up there that have, they've created problems, I'm not going to say havoc, but yet again, do we manage them? Is the management programme there? And at the end of the do day, Do they take no. fish, beavers? No. No. Otters, otters mink. Yeah, I mean, being truthful, uh, you know, otters will, will, you know, like most things, just they're, they're opportunist feeders at the end of the day, like a mink. You know, otters, native mink, which was brought in for the, the farming industry, the, for the furs, a bit like the crayfish. So it's a, a man brought in uh, product from another country, should we say, to what was initially for the table or the fur market. Uh but, you know, we, we're going on about all this, but we have over 3,000, you know, non-native species in this country. What are we doing about those? Why aren't we on top of it before we bring more things in? So what are you advocating, that the um, governing bodies, the NRW, the EA, um, invest more in... Yeah, I'd like to think that we could invest more into controlling things, you know. Himalayan balsam, yeah, I don't know, Japanese knotweed, we've got squirrel. There's loads of things out there, you know. We've got Asian hornets. There's there's so many things if you look into it. Uh, mitten crabs on the bottom part of the D that will cause bank erosion. So what do they need to do, these governing authorities? Well, they need to manage better, don't they, at the end of the day? Nothing's going to be successful if it's not managed well. The the issues for me came about with the hatcheries, they're not working. Well, nothing's going to work if it's not managed well. And I've got to be true, I don't think that was anything to do with fish. I believe, personally, that was a fiscal decision. Yeah. That was about money. Mm, that's what it's So getting back to your to. weir, taking everything off, out, yeah, was to do with money rather than well yeah access and the removal of barriers you know it's it's going to be a great public relations exercise yet again we've taken this out how long is it going to be before we start introducing beavers onto the welsh d i'm sure it's being talked about is it a good thing is it a bad thing being a cynic i don't actually look at the end result now I look where the funding stream is so they move on to the next project 
So people who know and understand the river and it's the best interest of the fish stocks, um, the gillies would be a good place to start, wouldn't they? Where, where does this word gilly come from and, and does every river have a gilly? Not every river has a gilly. Some can have river keepers, you know, custodians. Uh, gillies really is pretty much based around a, a Scottish theory, isn't it? You know, sort of Celtic. You know where somebody goes out and shows you. You know you are paying Is that a gilly. Where they come from from Scotland. Yeah, the origin. Pretty much so for me. You know where somebody goes to go out there and show you because of their local knowledge, mm. the best holding places, the best lies, whether it's in high water, low water. Are we bank fishing? Are we going to go in a boat? Are we going to go uh, tro uh, trolling for them? Are we spinning for them? Are we fly fishing for them? Are we bait fishing for them? Uh, and that local knowledge, you know, is, is very, very difficult if you're just nipping up for a week's holiday to acquire, you know, so... And they can also keep an eye on people's behaviour, the catch and release, that everything's yeah, done you know. properly. And, and, you know, there is etiquette within this, you know, you don't jump in front of somebody who's going down a pool. You know, there, there are particular rules of, should we say, that have been passed down through generations, how, how you accept things, you know. Certain places won't even let you take a mobile phone out there. You're not, you're not to ring, you know, you're going out there to fish. You know, if you're paying for my time, I suppose, at the end of the day, we want to give you the best opportunity of catching something, you know. Some of these beats can be extremely pricey. You know, and, and are booked for years in advance. You know, and those gillies, you know, it, they might be counting on, you know, if they catch a fish, you might give them a better tip, so to speak. You know, and they want you to come back. You know, it's a business, you know. And it's a gill huge part of the rural economy. It's a rural part. You know, well, let, let's talk about rural economy. What, what mm -hmm. does fishing bring into it? Yes. You know, communities survive on what I, fishing Yes, I thought fishing in. was a solitary lonely business but i've learned it is not at all is it oh not at all you know at the end of the day we might be all insular when we go down the river but i suppose it's the 19th hole when you get back into the duke of buckler or the queen's head or somewhere where we all get together and lie the about fishing stories and things <laughs> and what got away you know in all the years of fish nobody's ever said to me hey carl i've just had a little fish get off yeah, only big fish get off. The, the fact know. that the fishermen are so keen to put the fish back, you know, they do care so much about the conservation and preservation yeah. of the environment. Very, very much so. I mean, look, we, we're here, our lifespan, we're a custodian for that. That river's going to be here long after I'm gone. You know, we're borrowing it. We should look after it. We should nurture it. We should bring them back to health, you know. Nobody wants a polluted water, you know, at least the things that live in it, you know, and, you know, we are the greatest polluters, whether it be, you know, sewerage, I don't know, runoff from farming or other things, you know, we it, need clean water. The, the world needs clean water to survive. The, uh, the actual thrill of catching an Atlantic salmon, can you see the salmon? Can they see you? Do you have to be quiet is it like a stalking process or how is it best done? I think that's how you get brought up. I was always brought up to be the bank and stealthy. You know, as we said before, six inches between your ears. Think about what you're doing. You know, I wouldn't want to go crashing round out there, bouncing so things So they can around. see you? Oh, they can see you. Because they must be able to see something to be able to leap yeah, the weirs. Oh, they, they can see, they, you know, they have an, an extremely phenomenal thing down the side called the lateral line, which, you know, keeps them upright, magnetic units. They, you know, they can see, they, they, they feel things, yeah. Uh, so and, how do they leap? I mean, um, how do they leap up the weir in such style? Oh, uh, if you look at it sort of dynamics, it's like a torpedo, isn't it? The shape of it and this tail that's like a small shovel propels them. I mean, when you grab one and it's in condition and it's fresh in from the sea and got sea lice on it, and you might take your picture, you know, not advocate, pull it up by the tail and pull it in. Just get your hand underneath it nice and easy, you know. 
Make sure she's comfortable and get your mate to take a picture and get her back as soon as possible. But when you feel the strength in that fish, it, it's just muscle. You know, it's been at sea for maybe a year, two, three years if it's multi-wintered and it's going to come back in. It's in prime condition. You know, it, it, it's a bit like, I don't know, Linford Christie or Usain Bolt running through there. And when you feel that, that little kick and you see the size of the tail, you'll know why they can leap so high. A, a brown bear can catch a fish with his paws, can't he? How do they do that? Don't they watch I them think, leaping? And Right, OK. That, that, that's you've slightly, been with the brown bears, Yeah, I've been you? with brown bears and grizzly bears and black bears and things like this. That, that, these are different salmon over in America oh. where that happens. You know, these are probably coho, sockeye specifics, uh, a different species. Chinook, yeah. And when they, they only, they don't survive. They they die where ours can go back to sea, comes back as a kelp and goes back out again, sort of thing. Not not all of them, but, but some of them. Uh, but when you, you go over there and you, I don't know where I'm going to fish, Vancouver Island, and, you know, you can get a run of specific uh, salmon coming in. You know, you can, you can get hundreds coming in at a time. You know, and, and the bears know that at the end of it, you know, they eat certain bits. The arboreal forest is based on what the bears leave behind. You know, it's, you know, it's that circle of life. But to watch them, I mean, I've been on the Quinson River there, just outside of Campbell River, and seen up to 30 bears there, all hoisting out salmon. And is it right that they they eat the, the skin and the fat and reject the Yeah, that's what, what we goes back eat. to the line. Yeah, yes. you know, at the end of the day, they, they, they love their eggs. You know, it's all high protein. You know, they're not daft. They are trying to put as much weight on before they go into hibernation. Mm -hmm. You know, so they're going to cherry pick the choice product, which is the high protein food section. Now, I have seen a film that great. I'm not a, a, a fisherman at all, but I've seen this film, Robert Redford's film, A River Runs Through It. And I was extremely affected by the beauty of the fishing in the rivers of Montana mm -hmm. and the story of, of the poetry and motion of it all. And since looking this up, I found that Montana is an absolute mecca for fishing. Oh, Have yeah. you ever been? Been to Montana. Yeah. Through, uh, wait, wait. Been fortunate to take you know fish through most of sort of America, you know. Uh, are they Pacific the salmon? What sort of? Yeah, salmon? yeah. They, those are the you know they don't get the Atlantics over there. You know they'll get five, six, seven, eight other different species of are salmon they as over big there. As our oh, they can go bigger. bigger. You know some of the, you know the the Chinooks can be absolutely monstrous. Uh, don't think they're as pretty as ours, but there again, I am biased. Well, I recommend everybody uh, watch watches this film. It is. That's Norman MacLean, isn't it? It's about a minister on the Black... Is it the Blackfoot River in Montana? And it's how it's an he allegory, engages... A, an allegory of life, really, yeah. that the fishing story With his two is. sons, he gets one, obviously, that doesn't end up well, which is Brad Pitt, and then you've got the other one, I think it was Craig Schaefer, to play his brother. But their getaway and to bond as father and two sons was, was fishing. to go fishing. So the American rivers now, have they got a lot more fish than we have? I think I think worldwide we're struggling, to tell you the truth. I mean, you know. So they're you struggling with fish numbers yeah, as well. Yeah, I don't think anything's ever going to be back unless we concentrate more effort in there. Did pick up some figures though, which was interesting yesterday. And I know, the, you know there's the, probably about 350 million people live in America, but 75.4 million people went to angling last year in uh, well, America. Well, the, the Prince That's Albert Club number. that you're involved with has 11,000 members yeah, and 7,000 on a waiting list. Yeah. So th these are huge numbers of people. They're big numbers. One They're absolutely, you know, that, that's probably one of the biggest clubs in Europe. You know, but as I said before, to get something like that, it needs to be managed well. Yeah, and we because have an well, obviously committee. all these fishermen, when stocks are so low, do we want more fishermen? What sort of effect <clears throat> does more fishermen have on the, well, the yeah, balance? Well, Prince, Prince Albert's not just... Game angling, we I have see. coarse waters. Yeah, yeah. So obviously not everything's about Atlantic mm. salmon or trout. Mm. Uh, but do we want more fishermen? 
ooh, as somebody in the tattle trade that's doing it for a living, you know, the, the, it, it, the businesses, you know, it, it's what we put back into communities. There's, it, it's a multi-billion pound industry worldwide. Mm-hmm. If we took that away, you're going to have an awful lot of unemployed people. Mm-hmm. What are they going to do? Yeah. They'll go fishing. Mm-hmm. So um, have you enjoyed the Bob Mortimer and Paul Whitehouse fishing Loved program? Loved it. Loved it. I because think, yeah. that's also been very special. Yeah, it? It, it, it's special from the point of view. It just doesn't show fishing, does it? Oh, it doesn't it? <laughs> it, it? It's about two guys who've had uh, health issues yeah. going out there. One didn't fish. One does fish, done it all his life. Mm. Two different cultures coming together. Two guys that just so want to go out So you haven't learned there. anything from, about fishing from the <clears throat> programme particularly? Uh, I think you can always learn something, you know. I mean, every day is a learning day for me. I can learn things from the kids, Yes. you know, which is great. Simple things. The best analogy I've ever had over is it a sport came from a 14-year-old kid in Liverpool. And I said to him, what do you think that makes it? Why would you say that this is a sport? What makes it all these things a sport? And he said, if you have to change your shoes to do it. Sport England now use that as an analogy because, you know, living next to to Phil Taylor for, for you, the dart player, even he changes his shoes to comfortable shoes. What a cracking analogy! It was fourteen-year-old kid. A good example of a, another way of looking at things. Yeah. Um, lastly, what would you do if you were told by law that you weren't able to fish anymore? Oh wow, that's a difficult question I because uh, you know I would always want to be on the right side of the law. Yes, and I think you know there's there's always ways of appealing things. I would hate to think it would ever come to that. But are you saying that I couldn't go game fishing, I couldn't go course fishing, and I couldn't go sea fishing? You're you're blanking me on all of them. Oh, I'd probably be a rebel with a cause. A very hard question to answer. Yeah. Now, um, Carl, let's go on to the quick fire questions. Have you ever brought up a strange object, like a Wellington boot, for instance? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I caught a number plate. <laughs> on the... How do you handle a fish that puts up a serious fight? No matter what you need to do, is respect your quarry at the end of it. That That's the most important thing. You know, if it's putting up a serious fight or you're, you're handling it bad. That's a very good answer. Have yeah. you ever fallen in the water and had to swim out? I, I used to fall in regularly. To some extent, they called me the dipper and sent me an orange braid through the post. So, yeah, I fall in and still do regularly. That's why I never take a phone with me. Is there a fish that you've not yet caught but really want to? I would probably like to catch a golden dorado. Sounds good. What's the most important lesson you've learned from fishing? Never take anything for granted and be prepared for change. Well, it's been fantastic to learn all about this fascinating subject. Thank you very much, Carl. It's a pleasure. Thank you for inviting really, me really in. really, enjoyed it. A fisherman I spoke to about Carl, called George, told me that Carl had taken a group of children fishing for the day on the Welsh Dee near Groves Farm. One of them said, this is the best holiday I've ever had. He also told me that Carl is a master instructor who trains other fishing coaches in casting techniques, but more than that, how to control the cast and the fly in the most natural way, the correct angle, depth and speed to cause the least disturbance to the water. His website, The Adipose Fin, will help you learn more about his fishing enterprises. Thank you for listening and please share with your friends. And hopefully you will listen again on the first of the month when it could be you in the driving seat.